to life. Well, I am thrilled to be here in Grand Rapids, and I know that this is a fantastic town, right, because it supports this very large independent bookstore, and that says a lot about the community. So I grew up on a farm. When I was 11, my parents, who were missionaries, decided that it was time to get back to the farm. And uh, it was mostly my dad, who had grown up during the Dust Bowl in Oklahoma, but always had a really fond memory of farming and being in a rural area. So we um, ended up moving to rural Virginia to a very ramshackle farm, because my parents didn't have a whole lot of money. And we uh, uh, ended up living in this farm that uh, um, no one had lived in the house for decades, and no one had farmed for decades. The house didn't have plumbing, didn't have electricity, and uh, it was uh, quite a shock to uh, my mother and I. Um, my dad never did get around to putting the plumbing in, but we did eventually get electricity. And he had been an early supporter of organic gardening, having um, been a subscriber to the Rodale Press's organic gardening, and he did do some farming on uh, this uh, very rocky farm on the side of a little mountain in northern Virginia. Now, I learned a lot about farming with that experience, um, how to pluck chicken feathers, how to pinch potato bugs, how to uh, chop kindling. And I can tell you that I could not wait to get off of that farm when I was 18 years old. But I learned some of the most valuable lessons of my life in growing up on that farm. And I learned to respect farmers and people who actually grow food in this country. And I went on to uh, be an activist and an organizer and have spent most of my life in the, the public interest movement. But I've been very frustrated over the last uh, about a decade and a half as I've seen uh, the good food movement really blame farmers for the dysfunction in our food system rather than the real culprits, the, um, the corporations that really benefit from the food system that we have today. And I decided to write Foodopoly to really lay out all of those issues and to try to generate an important debate about what we have to do to really change our food system and I think to reclaim our democracy, right? So I'm going to start this evening back in the 1930s, and I'm really glad to see a, a mature audience here tonight because sometimes as I've traveled around the country and talked to different uh, groups of people, I've had a lot of young people who've been texting and aren't really interested in hearing about farm policy, and I've had to quickly change my presentation to make it more interesting to uh, a younger audience. But I bet you can stick with me tonight with a little bit of farm history. Because if we don't know where we've been, how do we know where we're going? So in the 1930s, when the Roosevelt administration came into office, they were interested in helping the rural population, about 54% of Americans at that time, and 6.8 million farms. Uh, they wanted to help people who lived in the countryside be able to make an income on par with urban workers because with the, uh, all of the economic problems in the 1920s, rural people were really hurting. And there was a lot of malnutrition, a lot of people were losing their farms. In a way, it was very similar to the economic problems that we have today and a lot of the same bad behaviors of the financial services industry had brought the country to these economic problems. So I think it's important to know about some of the policies that the Roosevelt administration actually got passed in that first uh, farm bill because they were very beneficial for several uh, decades. So um, they started a grain reserve. You know, China has had a grain reserve 
since about AD 54. And a grain reserve is a place on the farms um, where a farmer stores grains during the years that there's a surplus. And then when there's a uh, environmental problem or a drought, they can pull the grains out of the, um, the grain reserve and it stabilizes prices and keeps, uh, um, makes it possible for farmers to actually make a living because we don't have an oversupply of crops with the, the prices being depressed. They did other things like uh, create programs to take marginal land out of um, production and they gave a role to the U.S. Department of Agriculture in actually doing some supply management so there would be the right amount of grains and there wouldn't be this overproduction. And I, I know overproduction is kind of a boring subject, but it's really the crux of a lot of what's happened to our food program. And there were other policies to make it possible for farmers to actually make back the cost of production, which is why we've lost millions of farms because so much during the modern period uh, of farming, farmers haven't been able to actually make what it costs to produce crops. So these uh, farm policies, kind of common sense, not very sexy, not very interesting to people today, actually worked very well during World War II. And the U.S. was actually the, um, well, it was the, the food basket for the Allies during the war. And after the war, when Europe was devastated and we had a lot of the colonial governments around the globe falling and there was a lot of hunger, the U.S. really was the food basket. But a lot of other things had changed during World War II as well. Um, first of all, the financial center of the world had shifted from Europe, from London in particular, to New York and the United States. And the U.S. had become a manufacturing and industrial powerhouse. And there were a group of business leaders during this period and some political leaders that believed the real future of the country was in industry and manufacturing, not farming. And some of these individuals got together and formed an organization that most people don't know about today. It was called the Committee for Economic Development. And it was really at the heart of lobbying for a lot of the policies that are today the result of our dysfunctional food system. So some of the uh, uh, individuals who got together and put this organization together were the president of Studebaker, which you may remember was a large car company of that time, um, one of the uh, chief officials for Eastman Kodak, and another individual who was actually on the kind of the cutting edge of research about how you are able to get consumers to do what you want them to do, so advertising, polling, uh, that kind of research. And they believed that this Committee for Economic Development should be a merchant of ideas where business leaders would get together, hammer out um, different issues, come to some agreement amongst themselves, and then lobby for it, although I don't think that they used the word lobby. These were very influential men with a lot of resources who had a lot of different um, avenues to change policies. Mm -hmm.